subscribe and rate it. Five stars. Hello, Bobo. How are you doing today, sir? Good. How's it going with you, Cliff? Going pretty good, man. It's going pretty good. Beautiful day here in the you know boring Oregon area. Um, people have been filing through the museum, even though it's in the middle of the week, which I really appreciate. Interesting things are happening. Revamping a couple displays in the shop. PG film stuff. Got some new artifacts from the site. That I'm pretty excited about. So yeah, things are everything's coming up. You know, Bigfoot at the moment. Everything's coming up, Cliff. Everything is coming up, Cliff. Absolutely. It's about time. Get ready to head on the road with Mark Marcel later in the week and to go out to Pocatello, Idaho. Of course, this will air by the time that happened. Hopefully everything went well. I'm sure it will. It's going to be a great event. So yeah, just looking forward to doing that, man. Look, really looking forward to a road trip with Mark Marcel more than anything, though. Yeah, I'm going to be going in two days. I leave for Shasta, shooting there for a couple days, and we're going up to do a, a quick interview with Ron Moorhead, like I said yesterday when we recorded the yesterday's episode. So not much has changed. Yeah, not much has changed since yesterday. Well, cool. <laughs> Something that has changed, our guest has changed. Yesterday, we did not have a guest, but today we do. And uh, what a guest. This is a guest that uh, um, uh, I've been trying to get on for a little while, you know, but her scheduling issues and all this other stuff. But now is the perfect time because, uh, well, this gentleman has a book coming out very, very soon that is going to blow the socks off of a lot of people. Um, I've been helping out with the book a little bit. I know about what's in it and stuff. It, it's going to be fantastic. But really, let's get right to it. Um, we have not a researcher per se, but the son of one of the most famous, controversial, and active researchers of all time. We have Mr. Michael Freeman, son of Paul Freeman, on the podcast today. And he has come on because, well, no, he's got a book coming out. And also, secondly, um, he's kind of tired of all the misinformation, lies, fabrications, and rumors swirling about his father, and he wants to set the record straight. And I'm a big advocate of the Freeman and Blue Mountain evidence in general, so I jumped at the chance. Michael Freeman, welcome to Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and the Bobes. I'm so happy you can come on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, I know, uh, you know, Cliff and I, we talk often, but uh, James, I think we've only spoken once. We talked twice, but it was it was we had we had a couple we had like a four hour conversation and then like a two and a half hour conversation. Okay, all right, yeah, I, I, I know we spoke at least once. We were on the same page. Your dad's underappreciated and uh, gets a lot of bum raps, and we we're yeah. And I'm glad that you're setting the record straight and took the time to write a book to clear his legacy. Yeah, uh, well, that's the plan, and you know that's what I'm hoping to look to do because you know there is a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding. There's a lot of mystery and there's a lot of, of rumor, you know, that, that surrounds my father. Uh, and I just, you know, let, let me start, I guess, by saying, uh, before we even do anything else here today, that's, uh, we are in the business of evidence. We are not in the business of rumors and hearsay. That's a really important point because so much of the, so many of the reasons that people may not like your father's evidence is because they heard so and so thinks this about it, you know. And what kind of what kind of um, researching is that, you know? Because uh, you know, Rene de Hinden kind of went back and forth on your dad's um, evidence for a while, and there were some things he was absolutely positive were were not real. Um, and people, oh, Rene didn't think the evidence was real. Well, so what? What do you think about the evidence? Or have you never seen it is the question. Because um, I find a lot of these people talking smack about your dad have never really spent the time with the evidence or they may have seen one or two casts. And um, and, while, and I, since I did bring up Rene, I want to kind of defend Rene in a way. He was a very good researcher. He, he, he was really meticulous and thoughtful in a lot of things he did. Um, but he was also kind of, you know, he talked a lot of smack about other people. And also, and this is the point I want to make, he did not have the information about the Sasquatch foot that we do today. Um, I, there's a video on uh, Todd Prescott's excellent site of Sasquatch Archives where the um, the shows that Rene de Hinden's with a handful of people in his backyard and they lay out. I think it was the 87 trackway. Um, I think there were five footprints in a row for the 87 trackway, if I remember correctly. And he laid them all out and he just kind of dug into them and said, ah, this and that. Look at the sausage toes. Are you telling me this and that? And, um, and thankfully, Dr. Meldrum jumped on board and wrote um, uh, an answer to every one of the things that Rene de Hinden found to be a 
problem about that trackway. And the, see, what it was is Rene didn't know as much as we do now about the Sasquatch foot. So his criticisms were based on less information. But now that we know so much more about the Sasquatch foot and its capabilities and flexibilities and all that stuff, what Rene actually was um, nitpicking about are actually reasons to think that they're real. Like Rene was always commenting about the sausage toes because they look like little sausages. But what he didn't understand is that the, the, um, the toes um, have a lot of what's called dorsiflexion, um, basically flexing upwards. And when if your toes are flexed upwards, the only part of the toe that's going to impress into the ground are the toe stems, and they're going to be pointy at the end, and they don't look like toes. But they are. And you can see some of these things in those casts. And Renee saw them and thought that it was nonsense and fake because of it. But um, yeah, so I would encourage people out there to maybe perhaps form their own opinion instead of relying on those who came before us that perhaps don't know, didn't know or don't know as much about Sasquatch footprints as they could have. So yeah, rumor versus evidence, man. Well, anyway, um, so um, your dad got into this in 1982 um, when he saw one on June 10th, 10th, right? It was the 10th or 6th, 10th. June 10th, 1982, correct. Yeah. How old were you at that time? I was five years old. Five years old. Do you have any recollection of that? Um, I I do. Um, I don't necessarily have any recollection of him talking about the sighting or Bigfoot, but I have recollection of people. Um, and one of the gentlemen we were just discussing, Rene DeHinden, is someone that I remember vividly uh, being at our home on multiple occasions. Uh, I remember him sleeping on our pull-out sofa bed. And I have uh, real vivid memories of Grover Krantz as well and the, the cloud of smoke from his cigarettes that kind of always surrounded him, kind of like pig pen from you know, peanuts in the dust. If you, if you imagine Grover, uh, but I was a little too young to have, I think a lot of real vivid memories of what was happening at the time, as far as his sighting and him kind of getting in the paper and becoming somewhat of a celebrity, you know, or, uh, any of the problems that he was having with the forest service and things like that. Um, I have, I think better memories now that I'm older because I know more information. So it seems like I remember a lot. But I think a lot of that is, is stuff that I've learned since I got older. Yeah, and learn from a variety of sources or from your uh, just the family members or talking to your dad or I guess it's uh, all of those and more, right? Uh, yeah, all of those and more, a variety of sources. You know, obviously, I grew up with Bigfoot, you know, uh, from the time I was five. So that was normal to me. Uh, heard all the stories. You know, I've, I've been out in the field and, and I've seen tracks and things like that. But also, you know, I've been around, uh, you know, West Summerlin and, and I've been in Grover Krantz's lab at WSU. And then, of course, as I get older and I make all these acquaintances like you guys, you know, and other people, uh, I always learn more information because, you know, not everybody knows everything. And uh, sometimes I learn things that are new to me, you know, still this week. Well, yeah, Bigfoot is kind of the gift that keeps on giving in that sort of way, I, I would imagine. And you're and you're, you're part of like Bigfoot royalty, so a lot of people have crossed your family's path at one point or another and have interactions with your dad or or uh, Wes, um, I think, you know, or, or a lot of the unsung heroes of the Blue Mountain evidence. And you know, that's something I'd like to bring up and, and point out is that the Blue Mountain evidence um, is very often all just referred to as a whole as the Freeman evidence. But that's not really the case. Your dad was out there a lot, but but at the same time, there were a lot of other people involved. Maybe talk about some of them for us. Yeah, you. Well, I mean, you had my dad, uh, and he's kind of generally, I think, considered one of the leaders of of that group. You know, he's not the elder statesman because Wes Summerlin was the elder statesman of of that group. And, you know, and a fine cowboy and a fine tracker in, in his own right, and was uh, already experienced in, in Bigfoot by the time my dad even came around. Uh, you had uh, David Bean, who was a professional tracker as well. Uh, Bill Lowry was a, a scientist uh, and a game warden, I believe, at one point in time. Uh, he was out there. You had uh, Dar Glasgow Addington. She was Dar Glasgow at the time. Um, she was out there in the field. And, uh, you know, since we brought her up, she's a, a lovely human being and a real pioneer, actually, as being one of the early female researchers and especially, you know, for that particular area. But there was a lot of people that were out there. Uh, Kranz came out there and he spent a lot of time with my dad after 82. You had uh, people like Greg May, who was a uh, survival expert and wilderness survival instructor at Washington State University. And he spent a lot of time out there and was part of that entourage for about four or five years. 
Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone as well. Uh, but yeah, there it's, it's not just my dad and it's not just his evidence. There's multiple people pulling multiple footprints and hair samples and finding trackways and even having sightings, you know, over this 15, 20 year period, but everyone likes to pile it on the Freeman name. So, you know, I, I hear that all the time. Yeah. For those listening that don't, I was going to say, for those listening, the Freeman we're talking about is the Freeman footage is the footage of the Bigfoot walking away. Like where it made a, people think it might be picking up a baby. It's a color clip. Just, just so people know what we're talking about. Yeah. And really all the Freeman evidence. Cause I, he, he was working that area for 10 years before he got the footage. Um, any footage really. I think the, he got two little clips over the years. One at D duck Springs. We'll get to that in a few minutes, but uh, for now, um, so there was a, a whole gang of people. You probably listed off at least eight. I wasn't counting. I probably should have been at least eight or maybe 10 people there. Um, and all of their evidence put together for that 20-year span of high activity, the golden age of the Blue Mountains, um, from my counting, is about 60 or so track finds. A lot more prints, but that's because people, uh, good researchers, go to a location, and if there's multiple prints, they usually come back with multiple casts. Um, that's not always the case, but uh, it started being the case with your father, I know. Your, your, I think your dad started with one or two casts from a location, but he eventually started bringing lots of casts back from certain track finds. Correct, yeah. And you know that is something that I would like to touch on because I think there's a, a misconception by a lot of the general public when they think about Bigfoot or you know, finding Bigfoot tracks or having casts that if you have, let's say 30 casts, that means that you found footprints on 30 different occasions from 30 different individual animals. Um, and that certainly isn't the case and that's not true. And when you look at, let's just say my father in his 15 years of research in the blue mountains, he's got about 45 to 50 casts, I think is, is what the number is. Um, and that averages out to about three casts per year, which isn't something, you know, that's an outrageous number over a 15 year period. And when you start taking into account that there were two, three, up to five, sometimes casts that were taken from a single trackway that really cuts that number down even more. It's not like he was out there finding tracks and making casts every day. We're talking about finding maybe one or two sets of tracks per year. If that, you know, and, and out of the 45 to 50 casts that we have, um, we have seven casts that come from the first six days that he was ever even exposed to Bigfoot, you know, that were, that were, that were taken. So that cuts that number down, you know, to like what, 38 something or, you know, around there. But, um, and I think that, you know, at least Cliff, you're in agreement with me when we look at the Blue Mountain evidence that we're looking at probably four or five individuals in about 15 to 20 years. There's not a whole lot of Bigfoot running around there. Two that we can identify completely, you know, um, that we think are female and we can get into that, you know, also in a little bit. And then we have a big male that is very elusive that we don't have a whole lot of evidence on. And then we have the possibility of one or two more in the early 80s, which we're not quite sure. One of them could be one that we already know of, but we're, we're looking at probably about four or five and then maybe a juvenile that gets thrown into that. So it's not like my father has 45 casts. It's 45 different Bigfoot that are running around outside of Walla Walla. You know, we're looking at you know, four animals in 20 years. Well, you know, um, I was counting today because I was thinking about that same. I know we we're going to talk about this at some point about how many per year. Well, I started counting up um, the track finds in the Bluff Creek region during the Bluff Creek Golden Age, which is 1958 to 1968. Um, and, uh, and I just counted track finds not individual tracks. And as far as track finds go, there were something like 17-ish. And I'm sure I'm missing one or two, but because uh, I don't have records of all that stuff, but I have a, a pretty decent record. Um, so let's just say, let's just say, give it the benefit of the doubt, 20, maybe, maybe as many as 20 different track finds um, that there are casts from. Um, and so that's what, two a year. So but the people who complain about Paul Freeman finding three a year is being too many well, what do they have to say at the Bluff Creek stuff? You know, because the, the, there were two, two a year on average there. And some of those track finds, there were 10 or more casts obtained from them, like the patterson Gimlin site, for example. So I don't know. It seems that some of the, um, the arguments against the Freeman stuff, like he is the luckiest Bigfooter in the world, or they're just, he's finding too many things to be taken seriously. Well, not, not really when you look at it from that perspective. Um, and as a follow-up question of what you're saying, 
by the best of your memory, how many weekends or whatever a month did your dad spend in the woods? Because the Bluff Creek situation wasn't like that. They weren't, they weren't out there two or three times a month. A lot of time in the woods. And, uh, you know, when, when this book comes out, hopefully next month, uh, we're going to go more into detail in that as well. And, and kind of how that affected, you know, my mother and my family, but, uh, we're talking, uh, three to four days a week, um, at least four, four or five hours at a time, at least, uh, sometimes overnight, sometimes a week at a time, uh, sometimes two weeks at a time gone from home camping by himself in the mountains, uh, before cell phones, uh, with no way to be in contact, you know, with my mom who, you know, uh, for some periods of time, didn't know if he was alive or dead until he, you know, got into CV range and he could call her on his CB radio. And, you know, we had one at the home as well. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the man spent, um, a lot of time, uh, more time than he, he probably should have to be honest. Well, you know, you, you bring something. I know we're all over the place. It's an exactly linear conversation, but you mentioned your mother. Um, and and I, I'm a big advocate of the support team for Bigfooters in a lot of ways, because I have one myself. I've got a wife at home when I'm out in the woods, and I know she worries about me sometime and whatnot. And your mother is one of these sort of casualties of, of the Bigfoot thing as well in some ways. I mean, what kind of a consequence or what kind of a, a weight did your mother carry because of your father's, for lack of a better term, obsession with the subject? Uh, well, she had a lot of worry, you know, I can tell you that much. She always worried about him um, and whether he was okay or, or, you know, what he was doing or and when he was going to come home. And uh, there was financial burden as well. I mean, when you spend three or four days a week away from home in the mountains, that's three or four days a week that you're not working, you know? And, and so uh, we, we didn't have money growing up really. And uh, there wasn't much funding for Bigfoot research and, when my grandmother died and, and left her home to my mother, uh, my parents sold it to support my dad's Bigfoot research, you know, and he spent a lot of time working a, a night job so he could get off work at, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning and go directly to the, to the mountains um, and then come home and get what sleep he could and, uh, you know, go back to work and then turn around and go back to the mountains the next day. But, you know, my mom even dealing with all that, my, my mother was great. And, uh, she's actually, if you don't know this responsible for at least 99% of the documentation that was done on any of my dad's evidence, uh, with the exception of his map. That's the one thing she never touched was his map in the garage. And I know that Cliff, you have that at the, the Bigfoot center there in boring. Now it's on display. It's lovely. Um, but, uh, every photograph we have, that is documented is my mother's handwriting. Every letter of correspondence that was written to anybody else was typed by my mother. Uh, display boards that were put together for, you know, mall setups or going to any type of meeting or, or convention where he was speaking was done so by my mother. Um, she worked tirelessly to catalog this stuff. And my, my father gets credit for doing a really good job of documenting his evidence for the time period that he was a researcher because he was one of the ones that was best at it. Uh, but if you want to know the truth, it was my mother that did that. Uh, you know, and, and my dad wanted her to, but, but she stuck by it and she did it and she stuck with him through thick and thin and, and through, you know, taking, uh, criticism and being the wife of the crazy person and, and all this stuff. Uh, you know, she deserves a lot of credit. And I actually, I have one picture of her in the field, <laughs> it's going to be in the book. Um, it's the only one I've got. She's actually out there standing in the field, you know, attempting to do some type of research, but, uh, you know, that wasn't her thing. And, but she certainly was active behind the scenes and, and we owe her a debt of gratitude, uh, for the documentation that she did. Otherwise a lot of this stuff would still be a mystery. Thank you, Mrs. Freeman. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Freeman. Absolutely. And of course, uh, thanks to all the support teams of all these Bigfoot weirdos out in the field, you know, whether it's my wife, Melissa or, or Carita, the angel that, uh, that helps Bobo out. She's a barely, barely tolerable system. Oh, please. She's an angel, Bobs. Like, no, I love you so much. She, she, she barely tolerates my Bigfooting. Oh, okay. Well, there, that I understand. That I thought, I thought you meant you could barely tolerate her. And I said, oh my gosh, no, Bobo. No. Something else, you know, to, to just add to that, that I didn't mention, um, was it, my entire childhood, uh, my, my entire life, my mother was a housewife. She never had a job. 
Uh, my, my dad was the sole supporter. She, she raised children. And as my uh, dad got older um, and, you know, around, I think it was right around 1990, 1991, as his, his health started to decline um, and, and he w- wasn't working as much and he was spending more time out there. She actually went and, and she went to community college and she got a degree and she went and got a job um, as an accountant. And uh, was supporting the family pretty much at that time, which allowed my dad to spend more time out doing, you know, research. So, did not know that. That's interesting. That's very cool, actually. Yeah, it is. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. So um, back in 1982, when your dad had his first sighting there in the Mill Creek watershed, he, from what I've read, um, and what, what I believe I think I know, is that he was basically one of these outriders, uh, somebody on a horseback kind of uh, patrolling the watershed circumference to make sure that nobody is going in there because the whole area is off limits. Um, he had a sighting thing, crossed the road, he smelled it, he saw it, he cast a couple prints there. Uh, rumor has it, and I'd like I'd like some clarification on this, please. Rumor has it that your dad was fired. Is that true or not? Uh, well, first of all, he was a boundary patrolman, so uh, and he he was not on horseback. He had a service vehicle, uh, and he was responsible for twenty five square miles of of the watershed. Um, now, to answer uh, your question, uh, no, he was not fired. Uh, that is a, a, one of those nasty rumors. Um, my dad actually quit working for the forest service. Uh, he was, um, demoted to a desk job. He was not allowed to go out and drive around or walk around anymore because they did not want him looking for Bigfoot or saying anything else about Bigfoot and had taken some public criticism from the forest service. And, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, my, my grandmother had passed away and left uh, a house to my mom. And that was in Camas, Washington, which is, where we were from. And it was a really good excuse to say, I'm out of here and, uh, you know, go start a, a new life someplace else. And, you know, as we know, that didn't last very long. Yeah. He, he would, uh, go back to the woods in, um, Walla Walla though, wouldn't he? Even, even while he lived in Camas? He, he would. Yeah. Uh, when we moved back to Camas, um, they actually, uh, he, my parents opened a deli and smoked meat shop downtown Camas, Washington. It was called Freeman's. And it was, it was pretty successful. Um, but, uh, yeah, he couldn't stay away. You know, he saw something that changed him and every weekend he was going back and this is, you know, between 1983 and 1986, every weekend, every chance he got, he was leaving and he was going and he wasn't working for anyone at the time except himself because it was my parents' business. And so he was, you know, leaving and he, and he was leaving my, my mom and, and my older brother, you know, who was 16, 17 at the time, were pretty much, you know, kind of running the, you know, their, their deli there. Um, but uh, yeah, he would disappear. I didn't know any better. Uh, I was too young. I really wasn't sure what was going on, except, you know, dad was gone. He was, he was doing this. He was doing that. He was working. Um, but he, he was going back to Walla Walla. Uh, often he would take my older brother with him. And uh, he was hunting Bigfoot in, in that time is what he was doing. Um, and that's why we don't have a whole lot of casts or tracks that, that come out of that time period, because that's not what he was interested in. He was spending a lot of time in the Winnaha two candid wilderness, and uh, he was going to kill one. I mean, that, that's what he was there for. What uh, caliber rifle was he carrying for that job? Uh, he had a three fifty six Norma Magnum rifle. That'll work. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much a safari gun. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh my God. So um, much has been made out of um, the, the professional tracker, Joel Harden's uh, work on your dad's uh, track find because he was brought in after um, in June of 1982, at the very end of June, because there were two track finds over that time. Uh, not only was your uh, was your dad's initial sighting there, but uh, six days, I think six days later, you're the expert. You could probably correct me, please, if I'm wrong. Six days later, uh, there was another track find there. Um, of the famous dermals, uh, the footprints that uh, gave that animal its name. And uh, Joel Harden was uh, brought in to uh, check them out, and he deemed them fake. Um, uh, and, of course, most people, I'm sure most of our listeners are aware of this because they have read Dr. Krantz's book, Bigfoot Sasquatch Evidence, or the first edition, which is Big Footprints. And, of course, if you're one of our listeners who has not read this, you really ought to read Dr. Krantz's book. That's kind of required reading for Bigfooters, in my opinion. Um 
it seems to me that uh, a lot of the things that Joel said about those tracks, why they were fake, um, well, this, it seems largely due to the fact that Joel was an experienced man tracker and Sasquatches are not humans. Um, because the things, I, I mean, I just reread the chapter last night in preparation uh, for uh, this interview. Um, but, and I, when I say the chapter, I not only read Dr. Kranz's chapter, but I also read the chapter in Joel's book himself, his own book, um, critiquing, uh, these particular tracks. And I gotta say, like, um, I know, I mean, I, no disrespect to Mr. Harden, of course, but I'm not very impressed with his reasons as to why these tracks are fake. And, uh, if, if I may, I'm going to read just something out of the book here, out of, out of Joel's book. So supposedly in his own words, although he may have had a ghostwriter, um, it says here, uh, the forest service added that some, somehow in the three weeks after the, the sighting, ABC, NBC, and CBS, all the television networks at the time, had gotten wind of the Bigfoot sighting, and they had all filed a court action in Washington to force the Forest Service to permit them access into the Mill Creek watershed. And then he goes on, and this is the key sentence here. The Forest Service had been given 48 hours to answer the injunction by coming up with evidence that reported the sighting was in fact a hoax. And that's why Joel Harden was called in by his boss to come look at these footprints. That sounds a little biased to begin with. And when you combine that with a sentence out of Dr. Krantz's book, and I have that right here. Um, uh, let's see. This is on page 79 of Dr. Krantz's book. Um, talking about Harden, he says, he judged them, the tracks, to be fakes. In fact, he made this pronouncement before he even looked at the tracks, according to three Forest Service employees who told me overhearing this. So that doesn't bode well. And of course, he does have specific reasons. And one of the reasons I thought was odd is that the dramatic lithics were too, in fact, the tracks were too perfect. They were too good, therefore they're fake. He also commented that um, there was no straddle in them, but that's a known feature of Sasquatch trackways. Um, he said it would be impossible for a creature of this size to have no to have no straddle like that. But yet, at the same time, that's exactly what evolution would eventually come up with because of their mass. Dr. Krantz goes into that subject quite uh, quite a bit when he talks about the gait of the Patterson-Gimlin film creature. Because if there was straddle, and of course straddle is the distance left and right of a center line of the trackway. Um, if there was significant straddle, an animal of that size would be wobbly back and forth. So you would expect a, a, a compact center of gravity, therefore a, a very little straddle, if any, in their trackway. Um, and that's exactly what he saw, and that's one of the reasons he thought it was fake. He also goes on to say that for a, for a human to do that, it's next to impossible, but he did say it could be possible with practice. Does that imply that your dad actually practiced walking like that, and he knew what a uh, uh, the gait of an animal of that size would be would be necessary, you know, would have to have. I mean, there's so many of the things in there just don't don't make quite much quite sense to me, you know. So, what did your what did your dad? Do you remember your dad saying anything at all about Mr. Harden? Uh, well, um, you are correct. Uh, June sixteenth is when the journals were found. Okay, so, so Joel was there a few days later. I guess he was probably there on the nineteenth because he does say he saw the tracks three days later. Right, El Elk Wallow was where they were found. Um, and, and the common misconception is that these were found by my dad by himself, and that's not true. He was with another Forest Service employee, a man by the name of Bill Epic. They found these tracks together. E P O C H Epic, uh, and they found these tracks together at the bottom of Low Canyon, a place called Elk Wallow. That was June sixteenth, nineteen eighty two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. Harding comes in and I have nothing against Mr. Harding. I'm sure he's great at his job as a man tracker, you know, for the border patrol. But, uh, you know, like you were saying, you got to look at the facts. He's a government employee that's brought in by a government agency that does not want to allow the media access to the watershed. He's brought in to say that the tracks are fake. First and foremost, uh, Mr. Harding also is not a believer in Bigfoot, so any set of tracks that you put in front of him, I'm sure he's going to tell you that they're fake. Mr. Harding also has no experience at all tracking any type of Bigfoot before or even higher primate. So, uh, you know, when you, when you start adding it up, he was kind of in over his head, you know, um, a, a little bit. And I also believe there's something in that book about sticking a straw three feet into the mud or something where one of these footprints were. 
Well, actually, uh, he, apparently, according to Mr. Harden's account, is that uh, while they were examining this trackway of eight or possibly nine footprints, um, uh, one of the other Forest Service workers at the site there, quote unquote, discovered another trackway um, right up the hill from them in an elk wallow. And then they all went to go look at it. And these were about 12 to 24 inches into the mud. And then he decided to shove straw down in it after, you know, into the bottom of the footprints to show that, um, that, that the Sasquatch had not bottomed out, but it was, it was just a, an artificial impression of some sort, but that doesn't make sense to me either. And I think Kranz addresses that in his book as well. Yeah, that seems odd. Um, you know, but getting back to your question, yeah, I, I actually have a, it's kind of funny. I have, I have a fantastic audio recording of my father talking about Mr. Harden, um, that comes from my dad's private audio journals. And, one of the things that he talks about is that uh, Joel Harden said that these tracks can't be from a real animal because animals don't have dermal ridges on the pads of their feet. Um, and my dad goes on to say that apparently Mr. Harden failed to realize that high primates do indeed have that. Um, and that even dogs and pigs have them on their nose, you know? Uh, so it, it's not something that, that's out of the ordinary, but uh, as far as, you know, Mr. Harden was concerned, you know, dermal ridges are a human trait and, you know, that's what he's used to tracking and that's what he's looking for. And he also, you know, as I said, he has no experience tracking Bigfoot. So he doesn't understand the gait or, you know, the anatomy of the foot or, you know, the flexation of the foot, um, anything like that, or even what an animal of that size, uh, that we would, uh, you know, presume is a, a primate would be capable of doing. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the things he wrote, he says, um, that he, uh, apparently, he he says that your dad admitted to hoaxing stuff at some point, um, and I, I don't think he was talking about the Good Morning America thing, which, which we'll get to in a minute here. Um, but he's, here it says right here on page one forty. Yeah, several times between 1982 sighting at the Mill Creek Watershed in 1994, Paul Freeman was involved in other Bigfoot sightings, including one in which we reported to having seen a family of creatures, including a male, female, and offspring. Local deputies searching the scene of the sighting discredited the, discredited the report and confronted Freeman. He admitted to authorities that he had not only made up the story, but he had also constructed some feet, quote-unquote, to make tracks as evidence to validate his sighting and had done so in previous events. What's that about? I don't know what that's about. Um, first of all, it can't be another sighting in 1993 or 1994. He didn't have any sightings in 1993 or 94. His last sighting was 1992 at D-Duck Spring. Did he ever see a family? Did he ever see a family at all? I don't remember a sighting of a family of Bigfoots. Right. Uh, so, you know, we're starting off with incorrect date information in the first place. Um, the only instance I can think of that he might be referring to would be the deduct footage where someone later in the year 2000, Doug Hycheck discovered what might be a baby in that film. And my dad thought that there were, you know, two adults in the film. Uh, but my father never claimed that he didn't even know anything about a supposed baby or offspring in the film until that was brought to him in like 2001. So I, I don't know anything about that. I know that there's no sightings in 93. There's no sightings in 94. Um, I seriously, seriously doubt, uh, first of all, that he was ever confronted by any sheriff's deputies. Uh, first of all, I, I just don't see that happening. Secondly, he knew them all um, in the area. And knowing my dad, and I'm laughing because I can envision his interaction with them, um, he you know, would have told them, and you can you can bleep me out here if you need to to kiss his ass um, and prove it is exactly what he would have said um, in a situation like that. Uh, so I, I don't know where this comes from. And, and you know, Harden's book, uh, this, this little section, I've, I've seen this before. I've read it. I've had some people throw it up in my face. Um, but I can tell you point, you know, for a fact, he never admitted to anyone hoaxing anything. Uh, number one. Number two, if he had, even to the sheriff's deputies, man, it would have been all over the papers. He was big news in Walla Walla at that time. Like, that, that would have been everywhere. It would have been in the news, you know. Um, and, and that certainly, like, didn't happen. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't even know where that comes from. But I, I would actually go as far as to say that that is complete fabrication. Yeah, or at least so, another rumor that he picked up and he printed Along with the, you know, the, uh, the other thing that surrounds this event that we haven't touched on is another rumor. As I'm sure you know, there's a rumor that Renee DeHinden had already spoiled Mr. Harden 
before he even got to the tracks. You know, but again, that's rumor. And as I said, we don't deal in rumors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rumors are rumors, man. I'd rather deal with the evidence. And that's why I, I, I focus on the evidence and put less faith in what people say for the most part, you know, unless they were there and are, or were witnesses of it, you know? Let, let's get let's jump right into the film because that's besides footprint casts and uh, some other uh, like handprint casts and stuff which we should also talk about but the the film is one of the things that your dad is most known for but very few people realize that that was the second time he filmed one so let, let's talk a little bit about that first film that very few people have seen um and even and even you, you gave me a copy of it and i still have not even sat down and gotten deep into it by the way so i apologize for not be, doing my homework on that level but but I have watched it. I think were you watching it with me? You might have been watching it with me. We, we watched it together. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, but but that very interesting stuff. I mean, it wasn't a great film, but and 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 but anyway, you tell us about that first film before we get into the big one. Uh, yeah, um, it's it's filmed uh, at a location called Green Peak, I believe. I believe it's 1992, so I think it's the same year as, as the, the DW Spring footage, actually. Yeah, I remember it being April of 92. I could be April, wrong. April of 92, yeah. Um, and um, the camera turns on. He's still in his in his truck. He's driving down the road, and he sees what he believes to be a, a, a Sasquatch. And the camera turns on as he's getting out of the truck. Um, and he's you know super excited, and he slams his car door. And I believe his exclamation or whatever is, I've been waiting 10 years for this. I, I think that's what he says. Um, but by the time he gets the camera up and it's not zoomed in, of course, and, and we go back to, you know, my dad just wasn't a technological, you know, guy, you know, and anyone who's ever seen that <laughs> or, or listened to, I guess, that, uh, audio from the returned camera, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's also on Todd Prescott's Sasquatch archive website. Right. You know, well, him and the gentleman that he's with, they can't figure out how to turn the camera off. Okay. No, he was a, he was an absolutely terrible cameraman. Nothing nothing personal against your dad, but he was he was not good with technology. He was not educated in that way, um, and he, he didn't zoom the camera in. You know, at Green Peak in this first video, and you can see there's a Sasquatch. You know, um, and it appears to be I don't know 60, 70 feet away, maybe something like that, maybe longer. Um, but the angle of it with the road and, and the trees, it, it, it's kind of difficult to see. And I don't think you can see the, the entire body. But uh, what's interesting with that one is that um, it stops completely and turns around to look at him for a couple seconds. It just stops. Uh, and, and then it continues on its way. Uh, and he ends up, you know, following it uh, and following some of the footprints. And we'll talk about those in a second. And uh, it, it ends up going in very dark, very heavy heavy forest uh and he kind of gets spooked a little bit and he isn't sure if he wants to follow it in there you know but um i know one of the things that you and i talked about and we'll have to look at it a little more in depth and a little further and i've actually been trying to look at some stills from the from the that video is that uh, i believe it's a different individual than the one that he gets in august um at d-duck spring it looks like it's probably a different bigfoot and it looks like it's probably an individual that we know is in the area from other footprints that we have from the past. It, it, it is an interesting video. I, of course, he did not do a good job from, well, filming it because of the distance and the circumstances. And, you know, I, I'm not going to complain about what he did because it's better than anything I've gotten. But at the end of the day, it, it's kind of a blah at the end of the day. So um, what, what was your dad's, co- what were your dad's comments on that piece of footage? Well, he's, he was super upset actually uh, because he thought when he took the video that, you know, this is it, I've got it, you know? Um, and then I, I remember he came home and, you know, plugged that old camera into the TV. So, you know, you could, you could watch it. And here's this tiny little thing that you can't even see because he'd made a mistake with the camera and hadn't zoomed in. And, and I think that one of the mistakes he, he made, I think a big mistake um, is that he slammed the door of his truck when he got out of it instead of leaving it open. And I think that may have spooked that animal or caused it to take a different trajectory. Not that it hadn't heard him driving down the road, you know, but uh, I think a loud noise like that probably wasn't helpful, you know, either in that situation. Uh, But, you know, he was upset, but, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it is what it is. And I know that it, it had some slight local media coverage, you know, nothing grand, nothing like D duct had, you know, and, um, the only thing that bothers me about that is, is I know what people say, you know, and I know what people are going to say about that is it's always oh, got two videos, you know, and like, um, 
you know, I've been doing this my whole life and I've never even seen one. And how can this guy get two videos? You know, and, and you go back to the quote that I heard earlier this week from somebody else is, you know, Paul Freeman's either the luckiest big footer that ever lived or he's a complete fraud, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's neither actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, Cliff, you can attest to this as well because you're educated on the subject, but you have the right guy who has the right skill set, which is a trained hunter and tracker who has the right area, which is a hotbed, which is what the Blue Mountains were, you know, especially at that time. And he has the time to devote to do it, you know, you're going to get more results. And, uh, you know, one of my dad's quotes actually is that, you know, if you go fishing once a year, you may not catch anything. But if you go fishing every day, you're going to get something. Yeah, and I think the right spot has everything in the world to do with it. The Bluff Creek in the 60s, they were there. They There, there was a group of them in that specific area, and that's why they got so much stuff. Um, the, 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 the Blue Mountains at that time, there were a group of them moving around in there quite often, and they got good stuff. Um, I've got a spot over in Mount Hood National Forest that have yielded, I think, at least four tracks in the last year and a half. It's the right area, so we're hitting it hard. Um, and you know, Moneymaker commented on this. Uh, if you read his expedition page, um, he comments that like, yeah, the, everywhere might look good for Bigfoot, but they, they're not everywhere. They're in certain areas. Um, and, and that's the truth. That is the truth. It's even to the point now, and I've said it before in the podcast, when people come in the museum and they say, yeah, I saw one up on so-and-so and I go, oh yeah, was it on this road? They go, well, yeah, it was on that road. How did you know? So, because that's where everybody else sees them. Because they hang out in certain areas. So the spot and the researcher um, are just part of a perfect storm that can come together if the, everything is right, if, if people are willing to spend the time out there. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, my, my father had the time to spend. He made the time to spend. He, even if he wouldn't have had it, he would have made it. You know, he, he, he made the time to spend out there. He knew the area as well or better than anybody else that's ever been there. Um, and he was prepared and he knew what he was doing. Um, and as far as, you know, being a, a hunter and a, and a tracker goes, he's one of the best that's ever done that. And I can't think of anyone, you know, that would even come close to being better than him. Uh, he was kind of the perfect guy in the perfect spot. People can say whatever they want, you know, people can pass judgment and they can do all this and they can, you know, like I said, listen to these rumors, but, uh, you know, and it's not just my dad, as we talked about earlier, it's the blue mountains and, and, and the blue mountain evidence and all the people involved in that they have produced some of the best footprint and cast evidence that's ever been found. And all you got to do is take a look at it. Yeah. And you know, yep, you can't look at one or two casts. I'd like to make that perfectly clear. Um, I will be so bold to even say that if you have less than a dozen casts in your collection, you probably don't know very much about casts because you have to be able to see a variety of casts and a variety of toe positions and flexations and all that sort of stuff to really start wrapping your head around what a Sasquatch foot is and what it's capable of doing. Um, it, you can't just look at a half a dozen casts and think, oh yeah, I know about big footprints. I've got six. Well, that's, that's cute. No, you need a lot more than that. And improving the pudding, Bobes, how many casts do you have? 60 or 70. There you go. There you go. And uh, yeah, so Bobo's like an unsung hero of casts and rec recognizing solid casts on the ground and stuff. But yeah, so you, you have to have a lot of these things. You just simply have to have a lot of these things to really understand what's going on. But, uh, you know, let's uh, let's fast forward a few months and let's talk about the most famous uh, Freeman footage is out there, which is the D-Duck Springs footage. Um, and you have such interesting insight into this because you know what your dad was up to at the time. You know what happened on that day. And you were even the first person of your family, at least, that he spoke to after the footage was obtained. So fill us in. Tell us the story of the D-Duck footage. Uh, D-Duck. Yeah. Um, well, um, the the week that that was filmed. And my dad had been to deduct every single day where he knew we were coming there. Well, it was a, it was a hot summer. A lot of the water sources had dried up and, you know, hot, dry summers are not uncommon in that area. It's, it's, you know, it's that high desert, Eastern Washington, you know, um, but that summer was particularly hot and a lot of the water sources had dried up. And we also have, um, and anyone who's ever seen his map, if you haven't seen it go to the North American Bigfoot Center and check it out. The area around D-Duck Spring is by far the most active area for Bigfoot evidence in, you know, that Blue Mountain region right there. Uh, year after year after year, you have evidence coming out of there. You know, he, he knew they were there. He knew they were getting water. Um, and he was going up there every day. And now my dad was going, you know, he was working nights at the time. He was, you know, getting off work about 4 o'clock in the morning or so. Uh, he was driving up to D-Duck. It's about an hour and a half drive. 
from where we lived. He was getting there around six o'clock in the morning. He would sit in his vehicle. He would watch the pond. Um, and then, you know, eventually as it got lighter, he would get out and he'd go look for tracks, disturbances, you know, around the pond's edge, you know, stuff like that. Um, and he was finding some things here and there, but you know, not, not a whole lot of, a whole lot of luck. Um, and then, um, you know, on the weekends he was getting up and he was going earlier because, you know, my dad, one of the mistakes that he made, and yes, I'll say it's a mistake. One of the mistakes he made is that he had it in his brain that they were coming before he got there. And that they were they were getting water and they were taking care of their needs and then they were leaving um, and that they had figured him out and they knew, you know, about what time he was going to come. And so he thought that he was missing them. Well, as it turns out that that, you know, that was that was a mistake. Uh, now, what's really interesting and what kind of leads us to the footage is actually something that was completely by chance. And that was that the, the night before he got the footage, which was Wednesday. And that was August 19th, 1992. Uh, before he went to work that evening, he got a phone call from my sister. And um, I just want to say, you know, my sister passed away uh, this June in a motorcycle accident. So, you know, we're all going to miss her and may she rest in peace. But she has an integral part in the story of my dad's footage. And uh, anyway, he got a, a phone call from my sister and her car would not start. And she had to get to work in the morning and get my nephew to daycare and, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, she said, dad, can you come over and fix my car? And so my dad said, yeah, you know, of course, of course I will. And, uh, he went to work that night. He had no intentions of going to D-Duck Spring the next day. None at all. He went to work. He got off work. He came home. He, he got a little sleep. He got up in the morning, you know, he went and got his cup of coffee at the, the Flying J restaurant, which is where, you know, he always went. And, uh, he drove over to my sister's house and got her car running so she could she could go and the best estimation of time i have and it's it's kind of debatable some people say he got to deduct around 9 a.m i don't think that's true i think he headed to deduct around 9 a.m so i think he left my sister's house around 9 a.m this is kind of the way i i interpret this but anyway he left my sister's house and he was going home and then halfway home he just thought well what the hell i'll drive up there and maybe there's some footprints you know or something I could find. Um, and what ended up happening was he ended up getting to deduct anywhere between three to four and a half hours later than when he was normally showing up. And like I said, the mistake he made was he thought that they were coming before him and leaving. And that's not true. They, they, they were already there and they were watching him. And when he was leaving, then they were going and they were getting their water. And, and I'm absolutely certain of this. And when he showed up late that day, he surprised them and uh, he walked right up on one. Or maybe two. Um, or possibly two. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that's something we're looking into. And I have my own theories on that. And we'll get into that here in a minute. Well, you know, uh, in my dad's own words, um, he thinks that when he drove up, when he when it heard the car, when he drove up and parked, he thinks that he startled it that it was probably at the pond getting water uh, because the tracks that are there look very, very fresh. And he makes a comment in the video that, wow, these are, you know, these are fresh. Um, so his description is that he thinks it was at the pond. It's Walden Pond, by the way, if anyone doesn't know that, it's not actually Deduck Spring. Walden Pond at the Deduck Trailhead. Deduck Spring is this little tiny spring that runs out of the ground that feeds the pond. But anyway, um, he pulls up in his car, he startles this animal and it takes off. And it goes back up the trail and it goes to the right. And as he's looking at the prints and he, he you know, gets his camera out and he's filming these prints and then he kind of hears it in the brush for whatever reason. And again, we'll talk about this, but uh, for whatever reason, it decides to cut back and go to the left um, and cross him um, and head for the watershed boundary, which is that way. Not only the watershed boundary, but there's also, well, you've been there recently, Cliff. It's what about? 20 yards after it goes off camera in his footage, there's about a 15 foot ravine that drops off into the spring. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, a, a little luck, a little chance, a little, you know, preparedness because, you know, he had the right spot and he had the right time of year and he had the right reason, uh, for them being there. He knew they were coming, um, he was just missing them because of something. Um, and I, I think that he was probably underestimating, uh, 
you know, their ability to, to watch him and, and know him and know when he was leaving and, and then make their approach, you know, after the safety of him being gone, instead of taking the chance of, you know, uh, just coming out without seeing him, you know, but, uh, yeah, the fact that he was late certainly is what leads to, it leads to him getting the footage, you know, um, another misconception though, I just want to clear up is everyone seems to think for some reason that this is the first time he rolled up with a video camera, you know, and he's filming and it is completely not true. I, I have hours of footage of him filming just tracks in the ground or he's talking to somebody else or, you know, he's, he's casting prints or my dog's running around and, and there's all these things. And he was reusing these eight millimeter magnetic tapes because we couldn't afford to buy new ones. And so sometimes we have different events that are on the same tape. And one of the things that we have with deduct is we have a casting of juvenile prints at Gifford peak on the deduct master tape. Uh, and, and they happen to come before the deduct footage. And what has happened in the past is people have tried to make the connection that he was casting those juvenile prints. And then he walks over to the pond and then he gets his footage. And, and people have tried to use this to say, yeah, look, I told you there was a juvenile in that footage. Well, it's not true that he did that because those are two completely separate events. The juvenile castings at Gifford Peak were done months before the deduct footage. It just so happens to be on the same master tape because he was recording over other stuff. What he recorded over my nephew's second birthday party to get the deduct footage. That's the other thing that was on the tape. You know, if that shows you how important the, the Bigfoot stuff was. Um, but you know, uh, again, for the last time, there were no juvenile prints that were cast at deduct. Those are from Gifford peak. Those two things are separate events. They are not connected. Um, I wish people would stop showing them um, as a connection to try to prove a point. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Here's what I think happened is, is I believe he pulls up in the car. He startles it. It goes up the trail and it goes to the right. And he, you know, he's looking at the tracks and he follows it up there and he gets too close. And I think that it comes back out to the left and it shoots him that look. And, and I don't think that's a friendly look. I think that's a warning. Um, because if you notice when it does that, it's a fast head step, you know, and it, it's not a slow, like, I'm going to look at you. It's a see me now. You're too close. Yeah, kind of like well, like what like what Roger Patterson described when he saw that Sasquatch look at him and give him that look like an umpire. He said that the, the umpire giving you the look one more screw up and you're out of the game. Exactly right. Um, and then it it keeps going to the left and it hides behind the tree and then it pops out and it goes about twenty yards and it drops down that ravine and it moves along the ravine and it pops back out to get that baby. I disagree with that. And then part of it, part of me for interrupting. And the reason I say that is because the, you know, you, you very generously gave us access to the original tape and we uploaded the original tape, which has none of the distortions, none of the interlacings that all the other, every other copy has on there. And, um, the baby, um, the baby pickup, if that's indeed what it is, is before we see the Sasquatch disappear and you can actually see the top of the Sasquatch as it's down or going down the, into the ravine. And that is later on in the film. I don't think it came back out to get the baby. I think it drops into the ravine and comes back up to get the baby and then goes back down into the ravine. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the case. I think it went down in the ravine after it got the baby. But what we can do, we can get the film out together and take a look at it at some point. But that, that's kind of my like interpretation is that, you know, after it disappears, I think it makes a beeline for that and moves along that and comes back up and grabs her and then, and, or grabs it, whatever, and goes back down. But maybe not. You know, like I said, that, that's my thought process on, you know, what might be happening there. Well, I will say that the, there is a cut in the film, so we don't know the time lapse there. So maybe you are right. We, I, I, we really don't know. And unfortunately, your dad's not around to ask right. anymore. And I wasn't there, uh, obviously, but... That's it, at least I guess I would say that's my thought process on what I think it's doing. Um, and of course, there I go again saying I don't like when people assume that they would know what a Bigfoot would do. And then I just did it. <laughs> but, you know, um, trying to piece it together. That's that that's my impression. But you may be right as well. And it may be moving not down the ravine until after it supposedly will say for right now grabs that baby. Um, but regardless of that regardless of whether you and I are right, we end up in the ravine at the end. And 
I think solely the reason that it even showed itself to him, it walks in front of him, it turns its head, is because it's trying to distract him from something and it's trying to hide something. And I think that what it's trying to hide is that baby that's back there that it goes and gets. And, and I think if that, if that baby wouldn't have been there and it wouldn't have been so far away from it, he would have never got that video. Yeah, very likely. Sasquatch would have just because you know to the right, to the camera right, um, there's a big slope, and you can go uphill and disappear into the trees. There must have been a reason it was hanging around, and it very well could have been that uh, the infant in the area. Has to be a reason, and if there was an infant there, it gives perfect reason for it to have that behavior. Um, you know, but you're right. There, there, there are some strange things in the newspaper that follow this event. Uh, one of them actually kind of backs the possibility of having a baby. And that is my dad's account of what he calls the second Sasquatch, which is the one that plugs the baby up. Um, now, I don't think it's a second one. I think it's the same one. Um, and so I don't think there were two there. I think that you're correct. And he overshot it and it came out in a different spot than he expected it to be. And so he thought that it was a second Bigfoot. Um, but I think it is the, the same one that walks in front of the camera. And I've referred to her as, you know, big Jill or whatever, but I, I think it's the same Sasquatch. Um, but when he sees that one for the second time, there's a description that's given in a newspaper that it turned to look at him and he could see what he thought was a deformity on the side of its head and neck that stump stuck out like a lump, uh, like it, like it was deformed. Um, I think that that's the baby on her back. And I think that what he's seen from a hundred feet away or however far it was, uh, through the trees right there, I think it's the baby's head that he's seen that look, looks like a hunchback or looks like a deformality. The, uh, the other account we have, like you said, is that, you know, he hit out in, uh, a uh, tree had fallen down and the roots had come up and they, they, you know, dug out like a little den and he, he hid down in there, uh, for up to two hours, I guess is, is whatever the estimation is. Um, because they had gotten somewhat aggressive, um, and he had heard some vocalizations that they were making and he thought that maybe they were behind him following him. And so he got a little nervous and he ditched himself out in there. Um, I think that up to two hours is probably not correct. You know, if, if this is what happened, I think that, you know, he, he didn't have a watch. He never wore one. There was no cell phones. Um, his camera, which wasn't even on, didn't even have like a timestamp on it. And I think that if you were under stress or shock or scared in that situation, you would have no concept of time. Um, and also we know this uh, as well because of about the time that he arrives home later. It, I don't think it can be two hours. I think that, if this happened, maybe it was maybe 30 minutes. Which, which would certainly seem like two hours if you're scared out of your mind. Which would seem like two hours if you're scared out of your mind. And I have an account of him saying that he was in, in a cold sweat, you know, um, basically getting ready to speak to the man upstairs and say, like, you know, hey, let me out of this thing, you know. Um, we also have my dad saying that during this event that there was a voice inside of him that said, that's it. You don't need to bother these animals anymore you got close enough, maybe you just need to leave them alone, you know, and, and whatever that voice was or whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, it's, that's something that uh, I've heard him talk about more than once um, is having that feeling during this whole episode. Um, but we do have a little confusion on the time, you know, and um, we know, or at least I think I know that there weren't two of them. I think that you're right. And he overshot that uh, and he thought there was two. And so he therefore thought the other one was behind him when it wasn't. Um, and I think he started to get a little scared at that point because, you know, if you're dealing with a wild animal, that's one thing. But if you're dealing with two of them, then the odds of the unknown happening goes up. Right. Um, and especially if the young, you know, if there's a young one involved, it, you know, then you're in real danger. So I think that, you know, uh, it scared him a little bit. I think that his time frame was off. And I also think, and again, nothing against my dad, you know, but uh, he was a big, tough guy. He was one of those guys, macho, tough guy. And, and I have this feeling that it scared him a little bit and that embarrassed him. And that, uh, you know, maybe that like I hit out for two hours, you know, thing was kind of a little overshot to cover up for that embarrassment. You know, and that, that's just me being honest and, and what I feel may have happened. Well, sure. Yeah, I think that's very reasonable. 
So um, the, the video uh, got a lot of attention, of course, and um, and it even drew the attention of national television, which I think is a good segue into speaking about the Good Morning America thing. Um, why don't you tell us about that? Because that has caused a lot of, of just damage to your father's reputation, and it seemed to be a total hit job. I mean, uh, tell, us, tell us about that. Oh, God, I'm surprised we went this long without talking about it. God, I'm so sick of hearing about Good Morning America. But uh, yeah, let's dig it. Let's just put it in the ground some more. So uh, yeah, 1987. Uh, some people always think it's early 90s for some reason, but it's not. It's ni- 1987. Uh, my father goes on Good Morning America with uh, Wes Summerlin and Renee DeHinden and Mike Dennett, uh, who's a, a skeptic, um, and gets a real hit job, actually, from from the network. And, um, you know, it's kind of a satire piece from the beginning. They're just kind of making fun of Bigfooters. But the, the real damaging portion, you know, comes into a, a real slick, just hatchet job edit uh, that they do on my dad when they, they ask him a question and he tries to answer it honestly. And, you know, the question they ask is, you know, have you ever made fake footprints? And my dad's just being transparent and he's being honest. And he says, yeah, I've made fake footprints. I made them in my garden at home. Um, and I'm, you know, trying to you know, compare them with what I'm finding and, you know, see if this is something that a, a man could do. And, you know, in my father's defense, he was doing it for you know, research purposes and scientific purposes. And he was trying to eliminate any possibility that somebody else was doing this and they were, they were fooling him, you know? Um, but what we get in the episode when it airs is, you know, the skeptic saying, well, we know there's at least one person who's made fake footprints and then it just cuts to my dad saying, yes, I have. Um, and then, you know, as his voice starts to rise because he's going to expand on that answer, it just cuts off to him looking at a piece of bark that's got scratch marks in it, you know, and telling the guy, yeah, these are real. Um, so they didn't even include his full answer. All you get to see on there is him saying, yes, I've made fake footprints. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, it, it's a black cloud, man, that is has been <laughs> over his head for 30 some years. Um and it, it never goes away. And everyone likes to throw it up. You know, oh, the footage is fake. He admitted it on TV. You know, no, he didn't. You know, that was Good Morning America. Or, oh, this is fake. You know, he admitted it. He's a hoaxer. He admitted it. He never admitted to anything except trying to do some experiments to make him a better researcher. And he got stabbed in the back. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, man, I, I've been fighting this for a long time, but I, I wish people would realize that there's an agenda there and, and realize that there were people like me who were present for that. And Jonathan Summerlin was there as well. He can tell you the same story. Like he was there when this was recorded. Um, you know, we're not the only ones, but, uh, the people that know, know, but you know, I, I would like the air cleared on that at some point in time. Yeah, when I, I watched that again not too long ago, and it got my blood boiling a little bit because that guy, the Michael Dennett guy, he suggested right in front of uh, Wes Summerlin um, that yeah maybe he didn't know the difference if he saw a bear or a Bigfoot. And and Wes, man, I'm surprised Wes held back and didn't just let loose on the guy because Wes is a professional mountain guy, you know, and, and a professional tracker. He was hired to track people. Down. Yeah, and to to say that to, in front of somebody is such a level of disrespect. It, it just it drove me nuts watching that. And of course, you've had to live with that that, that dark cloud, as you said too. So uh, it, it's it's a curse upon um, all the Blue Mountain stuff. And I've had to live with it, you know. And it's the good goes with the bad, you know. And around that same time, you know, my dad did a commercial for Dryer's ice cream. It's Edie's ice cream on the East Coast and, and Dryer's, you know, west of the Mississippi or whatever. But uh, you know, and he got some fame, you know, for that. And if you've never seen that, it's pretty stupid and comical. Uh, but uh, it's you know the the most amount of money he ever made for anything he ever did, Bigfoot related, in his entire life, including the footage. Um, so you have you know a national ice cream commercial, and you get some attention, and then you you go on a show like this, and you think that you're going to get more positive attention. And, uh, you know, they do something like that to you. And then you, you have to try to explain to everybody for the rest of your life, you know, why this happened. And, and then the rest of your evidence, you know, gets thrown out and, you know, put in the garbage. But, you know, one of the things that it kind of eats me as well is you know, when people imply, you know, that he admitted this or that he's a hoaxer, they're not only implying that about him, but then they're implying everybody in the Blue Mountain evidence as either being in on it or being too stupid to know any better. 
And now you're talking about Wes Summerlin and you're talking about David Bean and you're talking about Bill Lowry and Dar Addington and you're talking about Grover Krantz. And we all know that Grover Krantz is the smartest guy in that room. <laughs> you know, so um, it's just, yeah, it's it's one of those things. You, you, I've lived with it for, you know, 40 years. So, uh, you know, I'll continue to live with it. Or, you know, hopefully one of these days people will actually take the time to look at the evidence and not listen to the rumors. Yeah, that's got to be just frustrating. I mean, just that'd be so just hearing your dad called a liar over and over and over. It's just got to be infuriating. Well, it is. You know, every time you go on YouTube, every time you go to a social media site that has to deal with Bigfoot, every time his footage is shown, every time his name pops up, Paul Freeman, you have someone that pops up and says, well, he's a hoaxer and this is why. And I know it. Um, and it, it is. And it's, it's, it's hard to not respond to all of them. Um, and so it's, you know, and I was... You know, and James, when you and I spoke some years ago, I was sort of active in the Bigfoot community a little bit. And then I stepped back away from it because of this stuff and because I, I just wasn't ready to handle it. And, and I've kind of thrown myself back into it with, with doing a book and whatnot. And I've done it to myself. Um, but, you know, this time I have good people around me and I've, and I've got Cliff and Doug Highcheck and, you know, some of these people and they're helping me deal with this a little bit better. But it, it is incredibly frustrating. And not only frustrating on the level of, of research, but it's my father. Like it, it's not someone that I know, or I look up to, like it's my family member. Like it's, it's, it's a man that raised me. Um, and I know what kind of person he is. And then you, you hear just constant criticism and it, it'll beat you down, man. It, it, it's, it's hard to deal with. The, the connection there, obviously, I mean, it's your dad, obviously. That's a, that's a huge thing. I was talking to Melissa about this the other night um, in regards to the Freeman evidence. I think if anyone would know that if y your dad was up to sh some shenanigans, hoaxing things, making fake prints, fa making fake videos, you, the family members, would have seen some sign of it at some point. Uh, but that just isn't the case. You, you would think so, right? I mean, we had an entire room... It was the Bigfoot room. You know, it was the garage at one point. And then we, my parents moved into this, this other house and it was the Bigfoot room. And you had all the casts and you had all the stuff and the hair samples and everything, you know, was in there and the map and all that. And I remember, you know, as a kid, it was like this magical place, you know, and, and maybe I got to hold a cast, you know, if I asked, right. Uh, you know, that type of thing before I, I, I got to go out with him because, uh, you know, I wasn't allowed to go until I was 10 years old that's the first time I ever got to go look at any tracks or anything like that. I was deemed too young, you know, before that. Um, and then when I was 14 years old, uh, which was 1991, I got to mix plaster and pour a cast for the first time, which happened to be 1991 Mill Creek road. Um, and I'm pretty sure we don't have that cast cause it's probably terrible. Uh, but you know, yeah, you, you would think that you would notice, right. You would think that something this complex, um, that would, require this much work to do that someone would notice it. But none of the people he worked with, not Wes or Dave or Bill or Dar or Greg May or Krantz or any of those people ever had anything bad to say about him. It's always the outsiders, you know, that have something bad to say about him, or it's always the people that have something that they're losing. Like he's finding all this evidence and I'm not, or he's getting this TV show and I didn't like, those are the people that always have something to say about him. It's not the people that worked closely with him for almost 20 years. They all loved him. Nobody had anything ever bad to say about him. You know, you mentioned your family and one person we haven't brought up here is your brother, Dwayne, because I've heard uh, skeptics and critics say that uh, that's clearly Dwayne in the suit or something like that. Um, what, what, what role did Dwayne have? I mean, I know he's the one that took those fantastic photographs that don't get any press at all um, from what, 1988, I think. Um, but he also went out and did investigations with um, your father. Uh, what, what sort of role did he have? And um, did he did he stick with it or did he walk away from it? And why? Oh, man, he was my dad's like right hand man for a long time. Yeah, that, that hurt my dad, actually, you know, uh, no, Dwayne, uh, you know, he was, he's 12 years older than me. So he was 17, you know, when my dad had his, his first sighting and, uh, already an accomplished hunter. And he got to go out, you know, with my dad and, and do research and see tracks and, and all this stuff. And, uh, he was with my dad a lot, you know, they hunted 
together. They, they, they went Bigfoot hunting and stuff like that. And my brother, you know, he told me he, I believe one time on one occasion, he actually found tracks when he was by himself and he was just goofing around like out in the mountains, you know, hanging out. Um, and it scared him because my dad wasn't there. <laughs> um, and he hightailed it out of there and like went to go get my dad, you know, uh, cause he wasn't sure what to do, but he, he played a big role, you know, in the, in the earlier years of my dad's research. Um, and he got those pictures in 88, you know, and, and, and there's kind of a rift there and, uh, you know, they're copyrighted to my dad and my brother never got credit for him. Are they going to be in the new book? They are going to be in the book. Yep. And, uh, one of the things that, that happened was, when my brother got that, the picture, he took two or three pictures real quick, boom, boom, boom. And then he took off running to go get my dad. And they were about 200 yards apart. They were deer hunting. And my dad always said, you know, damn it, Dwayne, if you just stayed where you were, the Bigfoot was headed directly towards my dad. And when my brother got up to run, he spooked it and it changed the direction that it was going. Um, and it, it always, uh, was one of those, you know, things And my, my dad always said, you know, damn it, if you would just stay where you were. And I, I think stuff like that kind of got to him and hurt his feelings a little bit, to be honest. And then just the criticism, man, and the, and the ridicule and being like the, the, the son of the crazy guy and, you know, trying to go to high school and, and trying to hold a job and having everyone you meet be like, Oh, you're Paul Freeman's son. And, you know, all this stuff. And it was about, um, 1990, actually, it was about two years prior to the D-Duck footage. Um, and, and I have a audio recording of my dad talking about this, actually. Um, my brother came to my dad and he said, you know, dad, I, I just don't want to do it anymore. And if, if you need me, I'll still go out with you, but I, I'm just tired of it. I just don't want to do it. And if you listen to the audio recording, man, you can, there's like, you can almost like feel the hurt in my dad's voice when he's like talking about it. You know, like it, it just kind of hurt him a little bit, but, uh, you know, my brother is, uh, he's a, he's a private person, you know, he doesn't talk about Bigfoot and he, he, he barely talks about Bigfoot with me. And, uh, you know, I, I invited Dwayne to be a part of my book and to, to write part of it with me and stuff like that. And, and he, he opted not to do that. So, uh, you know, I leave him alone and, uh, you know, we see each other you know, when we can. And, you know, that's, that's kind of where that relationship's at. But uh, I love my brother and, and he was really integral, uh, helped my dad a lot in, in some of that stuff, but uh, that's not my brother in, in a suit. And I can tell you that. Now, you know, your dad eventually uh, um, it ended up having some pretty serious health problems and some amputations even, I think from diabetes, if I remember correctly. Correct. Yeah. So, so, um, and, and he died as compli from complications of diabetes. Is that correct? Uh, well, that's what they say. Yeah. I, I mean, um, he died of, uh, basically, uh, massive heart failure, you know, brought on by, by diabetes. Yeah. But, you know, basically it's a, a massive heart attack. Um, my dad broke the arch of his left foot in 1982, um, actually jumping out of a truck uh, and he was a big guy and he landed wrong and he broke it, uh, and it never healed correctly. And he, he had multiple surgeries on it, uh, you know, enough to at least cover, you know, fingers on one hand, at, at least five. It, it just never would take. Um, and he limped around and, you know, by the time he got the footage in 92, he wasn't walking real good, you know, and he was 49 years old and he, he was getting up there and, uh, you know, his, his health was in decline at that, at that point in time. But as you know, he could still move because <laughs> you were there at D-Duct and he was moving quickly uh, when he was getting that stuff. But, um, you know, what ended up happening is, yeah, the diabetes got worse and, and his mobility got worse and he, and he had a cane and, and he started to decline. And it, the, the worst thing that my dad ever did ever in his entire life was let a doctor talk him into amputating that foot. It, it was a, a horrible mistake. Uh, they told him the pain would be gone. You'll get a prosthetic. Everything's going to be easier, you know, and uh, that just wasn't the case because his weight made it hard to walk in a prosthetic. And then he gained more weight because he got depressed and he wasn't mobile. And then he couldn't go to the mountains anymore and he couldn't walk around and he couldn't hunt um, except for sitting in his truck on the side of the road. And if he did get something, he had to have somebody else come pack it out for him. He couldn't even do that anymore. Um, and he started spending more time in a wheelchair because he was having problems walking. And, you know, by the time he died, like we were barely even fishing anymore because we couldn't even get down to the water. And, uh, it's, you know, uh, 
Yeah, his decline was rough, man. But, um, you know, um, there's a, a whole section in the book. And uh, to be honest with you, when I, when I wrote it, uh, I wrote it about 2 o'clock in the morning. I was trying to sleep, and my kids were asleep. And uh, it just hit me, and I got up, and I got out of bed, and I sat down at the computer, and I, I wrote a whole section of the book. Uh, it's going to be the end of the book. And I cried the whole time I wrote it, the whole time I typed. Um, and I can't even read it without getting a tear in my eye. So uh, hopefully it, it has some kind of effect on someone that reads it. You know, that's because it's not just Bigfoot. I mean, we're, you know, it's, he's a man. And I want people to realize that, that there's a story of a man there as well. And tell us a little, now we're coming to the end here. So I know you have a hard out here pretty quick here. Um, tell us about the book. And I know it's not out yet, but this will probably air in October, I'm guessing. And maybe the book will be out by then. What, what, when is it due out? And what can we expect it to see and read about and hear and all that stuff in the book? Because this book is kind of the future, the, the kind of book we, we hope to get in the future. There's a lot of really interesting technology buried into it. Um, so tell us about the book as much as you can, please. Well, uh, it should be out, I think, second half of October is what we're, we're shooting for. And, and don't hold me to that because it's already been delayed, you know, a little bit, but it, it, it's a monumental project. Uh, and, and so what we have with the book, you know, this is not going to be 300 grainy yellow pages, you know, um, of all this scientific talk and, and pictures, you know, of dermal ridges. Um, what we're looking at is this is going to be a full size coffee table style book, hardback, with full size, glossy colored pictures. Uh, and we're going to have over a hundred, well over a hundred pictures, uh, from my father's personal photo albums and evidence logs. Uh, a lot of pictures that no one's ever seen of prints and casts and hair samples and pictures of, you know, Bigfoot and, and my family and my dad and stuff like that. Um, and we're also going to have over an hour of audio recordings from my dad's personal audio journal that he did in private that no one's ever heard um, outside of, well, pretty much me, uh, to be honest. And, uh, you know, uh, the publisher and anyone that I've chosen to share anything with this. Um, and they're going to be in there and it's going to be the him telling his own story kind of in his own words. And we're also going to have uh, new enhancements of the, the deduct film that a lot of people haven't seen you know, or at least hadn't seen until last month when, you know, I, I kind of showed it at a special event. And uh, we're also going to have some other footage that no one's ever seen uh, go in this book. And uh, kind of the cool thing, the, the technology is that the, the audio and the video are going to be scannable QR codes. Um, and so if you're not familiar with that, what's going to happen is you'll be reading the book and you'll, you know, let's say you're reading something I wrote and you get to the, the section on, you know, the deduct spring footage there's going to be a QR code there and you just open up the camera on your phone and you hold your phone over it and it's just going to pull the footage up on your phone for you to watch. Um, or it's just going to pull up an audio clip of my dad talking. Um, so you, you don't have to load a CD in anything anymore to look at pictures or watch video or hear audio. It's all going to be right in the pages of the book. Um, and I have some tremendous people uh, helping me out with this. And, and I've got you, Cliff, of course. You were kind enough to help me. And uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum as well has written a chapter uh, Thomas Powell, uh, Jonathan Summerlin, Dar Addington wrote a chapter, uh, Doug Highcheck wrote a chapter. Um, and I've written a couple, you know, chapters as well. Um, and we're going to have some fantastic footage and we're going to have some fantastic footage of this baby lift. Uh, and we're going to have pictures you've never seen and audio you've never heard. And it may not be the most, you know, uh, you know, I'm not shooting for the best Bigfoot book of all time, but I'm certainly shooting for the, the most dynamic book on the subject that anyone's ever seen. Sounds like it. I, I just want, I want people to like look at it and go, man, that's cool. You know? Um, and I, I want them to just look at these pictures of, of the evidence and stuff. And you know, um, what, what really gets to me and part of the reason I did this is my dad made these audio recordings because he was going to write a book. Like that's the whole reason he was telling a story on tape and it's unfortunate because I have about six or seven hours of audio and I can only use about an hour of it because as you understand, we have restrictions on how big things can be, you know, when you're putting the book together and whatnot. And, but, uh, you know, my dad died. He never got to, he never got to write a book. And so even though this is light years beyond, I'm sure his, you know, biggest possible dreams, this is my dad's book and I'm just the one that's typing it out. 
you know, um, but it, it belongs to him. And hopefully we can help set the record straight on some of these mysteries and some of these rumors. And hopefully this can convince some people to really take a deep dive, look at this evidence and, and some of this phenomenal evidence that we have that doesn't prove that Bigfoot exists because there's no proof for Bigfoot, but it certainly supports the theory of the existence of Bigfoot. Um, and we've got some of, you know, my dad has some of the best evidence that's ever been found. And, and I just want to get it out there and show people. And it is long overdue. I mean, your dad has uh, been thrown under so many buses, man. He should just have a bus pass because, uh, uh, I mean, it is long overdue. And I I think that your dad would be immensely proud of you. So congratulations on that. I I hope so. And sorry if it it sounds like I'm getting somewhat emotional over here because I am. But, uh, you know, I I hope my dad is proud. I, I hope it's something that he, like, would be proud of. Uh, me doing it and we just get his legacy out there and, um, you know, present this stuff. And, you know, here, here's my thing, man. And, and I'll tell everybody, like, I am not out to change anybody's mind that has an opinion on him, you know, in any way that that's not my purpose in life. Um, but what I want to do is I want to challenge people to take a look at the evidence and draw their own conclusion from that instead of listening to something that some bitter old man said 30 years ago, you know? Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I, I'm so pleased that this book is coming out. I cannot wait to get my mitts upon this thing. Um, and it, I think it's going to do so much for your father's legacy and for the Bigfoot community in general. It's going to be a historic event, the release of this book. Um, so, And thank you for spending the last hour plus with us. I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this one. I, I appreciate both you guys. And uh, I appreciate Cliff, you, you know, helping out on the book. And James, it's nice to speak with you again. And, uh, you know, yeah, hopefully the listeners... Uh, had some fun and hopefully learn something today. Yeah, let's set these yahoos straight on the legacy of Paul Freeman and clear up this nonsense and give him the due and respect, the respect and the praise he's uh, due. You know, I I certainly hope that uh, you know, yeah, one of these days he he gets the credit uh, that he deserves and uh, the the entirety of the Blue Mountain evidence gets the credit that it deserves. All right, well, Michael, thank you very much, and I will talk to you very soon. I'm sure. All right. I'll talk to you guys later. Thank you. Okay. Bye. So Bobo, that was a good one. I mean, it went pretty long. I hope our listeners are cool with that. I'm sure they are, but man, what a great episode that is. Oh, awesome. I mean, I knew he was doing a book, but I had no idea it was going to be this like Magnus Opus, you know, like it's just sounds incredible. I can't wait to see it. Oh, it's really going to be something. And and I worked pretty, I mean, I, my chapter's pretty short. I don't know how everybody else's is, but I, I made a, a very strong point, I think, there, because I, what I did is I personally, I don't want to ruin anything for the readers, but I took some of the Paul Freeman evidence and what it showed us about the Sasquatch in general, the Sasquatch foot in particular, and I brought other examples from other locations and times, and I compared them to those uh, the, the Freeman data set and showed how the, the data, it, the evidence is congruent. What what Paul's evidence first pointed us to is still being found in other places and times throughout North America. And I can't, I can't wait to hear what Jeff, Dr. Meldrum has written in there. And uh, I, I know Michael's going to have a lot of great insight. They even got legends like Dar Addington. Dar's never done anything in the public in Bigfoot, but she is a legitimate legend. She was there with Paul, with David Bean, with all these people, seeing these tracks in the ground, pulling tracks for herself out of like really famous trackways. And she's never got the credit for it. She is just a angel of a human being. I love her so much. Um, it, I just cannot wait to read, to get my hands on this book. Yeah. I think everyone that's heard that episode is going to be thinking the same thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And for our members, man, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to post some of the, um, the research we've been doing at the North American Bigfoot Center here about the Freeman footage. I think I'll post some of that. I'll share some of that outside of our, um, NABC membership because our NABC memberships, they've already seen these videos and got a little taste of what we're doing. And there's a lot more I haven't shared with them yet either, by the way, but I'll share a little bit with the Bigfoot and beyond folks in the Patreon section as well. So that's a little gift for our members. If you want to become a member, um, speaking of which, if you do want to become a member and get extra content every single week, 30, 45 minutes or more of content every single week from us. Sounds like a gift from God. Um, you can join our membership well, or, or a gift from dog. Maybe I'm a little dys- <laughs> dys- dyslexic. Um, so yeah, you, you can actually join our membership It's five bucks a month. It's a Patreon thing. Go to our website and follow the links over there. Uh, Bigfoot and beyond podcast.com. If you go there, you can do lots of stuff. You can, you can join as a member. You can also leave questions or comments. You can leave voicemails for us. You can do all sorts of things. Um, you can, you can dance and wear a funny hat too. If you 
you want. Um, that's what I do at the website. But anyway, go there and check it out, and then um, and you know keep following us, keep enjoying our, our podcast, give us suggestions. What do you want to hear? And thank you very much all for listening, Bobes. Your turn. Thank you. Said it all, Cliff. No, I, I, t- <laughs> I am a little long winded. I'm sorry. <laughs> No. All right. Yeah, folks, thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Michael Freeman for joining us. And yeah, check out the Patreon. We got some cool stuff we've been doing on there. And all right, hit like, hit share, let your friends and family know. Listen to Bigfoot Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. And until next week, keep it squatchy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond, that's an N in the middle, and tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 